Okay, so who here has heard about Looker? Has anybody here heard about Looker? Non-Looker employees. <laughs> okay, cool. So hopefully tonight, well first of all, thank you Frank and thank you for everybody for coming. We're super excited to be here. Um, we have a number of customers now in the land, uh, in the southeast, so we're always coming to try and educate the communities on what Looker's doing. Um, hopefully I'll be able to give you guys a bit of an overview about the company where we fit into the modern tech stack uh, for analytics and what some of our customers are doing with modern elastic databases like BigQuery, which our environment is on tonight, and how you can use Looker in a wide variety of data workflows from standard reporting, exploring data dashboards, predictive workflows, and more. Uh, but just to get started, I thought it'd be good to give you all just a little bit overview of Looker as a company since we're a little bit younger than traditional BI tools. Uh, we've been on the market for about four or five years, probably a thousand or so customers now. Um, we're, we're all here from the Manhattan office. The Looker headquarters are, are down in Santa Cruz, California, which is great when we get to go there to visit. Uh, you can see here major partnerships, Google BigQuery, Amazon Redshift, Cloudera, HP Vertica. We work super well with modern, highly scalable Elastic databases. A large large portion of our customers are running on that. So, who are some customers using Looker? These are just the really cool ones I like to show off. Um, for those of you who don't, haven't heard of Looker, you've probably heard of some of these folks. Uh, hopefully tonight we can tell you about why they are using Looker on top of these databases to scale out their analytics. Uh, but since we're in Atlanta, a little customer love. Um, Calendly is here, I don't know, does anybody work at Calendly here tonight? No. Shame. Uh, but yeah, these are just some of our local Atlanta-based companies using Looker in a variety of ways. So um, internal analytics, embedding Looker into their SaaS platform or an application for their customers, uh, and more. So let's talk about how our customers are using Looker and why they came to us. So let's, before we dive into how they re-architected, with a modern BI tool and, and, and data warehouse where they were, traditional analytics workflows. And this is probably familiar for you guys. Uh, who here has used BI tools in the past? Is it a data science heavy room or reporting? Can you raise your hand if you've used like a Tableau or a basic reporting tool? Awesome. And data science folks, or is it just a blend? Okay, very cool. So this uh, traditional architecture might make a bit of sense. So prior to maybe five or so years ago, I don't, I don't know the exact date, um, there were some early innovators for these uh, MVP databases that really started a new trend for analytics. But the traditional workflow around exposing data to internal users, external users, and even predictive analytics required uh, heavy ETL transformations on the database side. The databases themselves couldn't support analytics. So then you'd have to extract them into the in-memory database of your BI tool, getting further and further and further away from your sources of truth. And in turn, extracting in cubes, those reports you're then exposing are limited to those extracts. So say, for instance, when your, your, your end user, as always, has a different question, where they say, hey, can we look at this data by a slightly different point? You might have to go all the way back to the bottom of the stack, extract data, do another ETL job, load it up into your database, and then do that again into the BI tools queue, and then rebuild your dashboard from there. So there's a lot of issues with this, right? There's a lot of moving parts. It's not very straightforward. Uh, but you got to give them credit, because at the time, you know, we're working with the technologies that existed. Like I mentioned, there's been a tremendous turnaround in one databases and the technologies around them that really uh, allowed our customers to rethink this workflow and in turn do away with those issues, right? Those bottlenecks where the people asking questions had to go back to the bottom of the funnel and you know even enable them to ask questions on their own. So again, the key thing here, what we're here to talk about tonight is modern data warehouses and modern BI stacks on top of that. And this was the core catalyst that allowed these stacks to change. So like I mentioned originally, the databases couldn't support uh, analytics running directly on top of them. So you had to take out the data, and in turn those limitations came. But with the advent of MPP databases, and tonight we'll focus a bit on Google BigQuery, 
you know, massively parallel elastic databases, that's no longer necessary. You don't need to run that second ETL job out of it to keep the data support analytics. People are running Looper directly on top of BigQuery, Redshift, Snowflake, Vertica, those very, very fast performing databases. Not only did the database technology go through a new uh, era, but the hardware itself became dramatically less expensive and dramatically more performant. So there's just this whole new greenfield world of opportunity in terms of analytics, but the traditional BI tools weren't allowing for that next generation experience because you in turn had to extract it back out of that database. So let's just talk about BigQuery because we have a demo environment we'll get up into here a little bit. Why, why are we demoing on BigQuery? It has nothing to do with the funding we received from Google, I promise. It's more about the technology. So a key thing here, it's massively distributed. It's an MPP database. It never gets slow. BigQuery separates the compute capacity with the storage. So regardless of the size of the query, it's going to issue the appropriate compute resources to ensure an incredibly fast performance, which means from your end, people managing your database infrastructure, you don't really need to think about this. BigQuery really doesn't require high tuning or work on your side to make sure it's running appropriately. Uh, and not only that, like I mentioned, it scales inherently with your data size and the interactions you're having with it. So regardless of your, the, the size of your query or you know, maybe petabytes of data, BigQuery is going to perform. Snapchat, one of our customers, is running a massive BigQuery cluster. It's performing very, very quickly on petabytes of data. And that's just because of the, the sheer kind of new nature of this type of database. Where does Looker come in? A lot of our customers adopted the fast databases first, and they needed a tool that could, one, leverage that investment. Right? You decide to move to something like uh, Amazon Redshift, Snowflake, BigQuery, or even Postgres is quite performant. It doesn't quite make sense to then go and take that data back out again, because you're not going to be benefiting from those latest advances in technology and the latest advances in the hardware. Traditionally, again, there was no problem with the traditional approach, because you couldn't hit the database. It would break. It wouldn't scale for, for analytics. With Looker, we don't, we don't move the data. We don't ever store it into servers. We don't have any data storage. We simply look at it, understand how to interact with it, and allow users to explore data on their own. By not extracting the data, it means we can support a very wide array of use cases. We're not limited to the use cases that you designed the queue for. So that bottleneck is no longer really necessary because all of the data is available for reporting. You're not going to hit that wall based on that aggregate or extract. Think Tableau workbooks. I saw a lot of people raise hands here. Not only that, but by having all of your data in one place, you're not running into that kind of data chaos problem where you have a million different versions of Excel or a million different versions running on Tableau desktop that then need to be pushed to server, validated, and whatnot. All of this is going to be consistent because, again, we're all pointing at the same live data. Okay, great, Looker can connect to a lot of database. What, what do we add to this equation, right? How do we enable users to truly self-serve beyond dashboards, right? Where do, does our kind of unique offering come in? And really, before anything, Looker was LookML. This is a code-based, virtually abstracted SQL modeling layer. It's quite simple. It's, it's kind of elegant when you think of it. There's two components to LookML. Your schema and your view files. What's your schema? It's a traditional schema, but the joins are potential. Again, we're not pre-cubing things. We're just explaining to Looker how to get to different tables, how to get to different sources if necessary. Based on the user's interactions on the front end, Looker will know, oh great, this is how I join to that table if we need to get that data. It also means we're going to be running the most performing queries based on the use case on the front end. Beyond that, view files. Those are reflections of the different tables in your database. So first thing you do, you connect to Looker. Looker runs a generator. We pick up uh, a, a, a light kind of extraction of your schema and then a reflection of all the dimensions and measure all of the fields in your database. And then not only do we reflect what exists in your database, but you can go on to transform and create new dimensions and measures to expose out to your users. Now, we add some really nice things to this. We all know data, so it speaks SQL, right? That's the way you ask questions of data. But SQL has some inherent limitations. 
Put simply, Looker, Look, Lookamel is designed to do away with those limitations. For instance, if, if you guys have been writing SQL, right, you know that it's quite repetitive. You might write the same logic over and over and over and over again. Say that piece of logic changes, you have to go ahead and change it with all the different queries that leverage it. Lookamel, we're storing that in one place. Right? So this, this opens up an element of data governance that only existed with traditional, very, very old school BI tools. This ensures that not only is it easy to define the business logic, but everybody is going to be interacting with the same business logic. So you don't have that workbook-based confusion, right? I have something like gross margin, it's a transform field in my database. You and I, we're not going to do it differently. We're going to do it the same way every time. It ensures consistency for the reporting. It also means you don't really have to worry about letting business users go on and ask their own questions because they're going to do it the right way. Right? They're not going to get confused or do something silly because they don't really understand the data that well. Beyond that, it means that you can reference fields within itself. So when you're transforming fields within LookML, you're creating new fields, you can just point it to something else. So say uh, gross margin, you're going to utilize inventory item cost, total cost. Say that original field changes, you only change it in one place and it will flow through the rest of the model. So you only define it once, and this is what the data dictionary is going to be for your, your end users. <coughs> Lastly, everything in the tool is web-based. Like I said, we don't store data. We don't have servers. You don't need to download look around to a variety of use cases. You can support predictive analytics, which is what we're going to be focusing on today. But you can support you know, basic dashboarding. All these BI tools do that. What makes Looker different is when someone asks a question beyond the dashboard, hey, can we actually pull in this field? Can you change this? You don't need to go back to an analyst to do it. LookML is going to be able to write the SQL for your users. Right? But you know it's going to be correct. Uh, not only that, right? you can set up alerting mechanisms. The idea is we're not going to limit what's possible with the data. We're just going to make sure that everybody's leveraging the same business logic on that same performant data warehouse, and they're not going to be bogging you down with ad hoc requests and be able to leverage that modern technology. So what does the tech stack look like? What are some of our customers using Looker for? How do, how do their environments look? So first off, if, if you guys are familiar with uh, Tableau and traditional BI tools, a big component of their offering is ETL, those connectors where you can pull in disparate sources. Our customers are simply piping raw data into something like BigQuery, for example. Since Looker can, can perform the transformations, you don't need to have ETL. It's just extracting and loading. Looker is going to know how to make sense of the data based on the model. Right? Instead of relying on the BI tool for the full stack, now you can leverage something like a BigQuery, a Redshift, a Snowflake, a Vertigo. Regardless of the BI, the BI tool, that part of the equation is solved. There's a wide range of tools that support just extracting and loading data. It's quite simple these days. Because again, databases can support analytics, and there are tools out there that can leverage that. The second component is explaining that data to Looker. Right? Again, we're a virtually abstracted SQL model there. We're a super lightweight piece of software that is really just I think of it as an uh, instruction manual for Looker to write SQL for your users based on your best practices. Right? You guys explain to Looker how to do it so you know it's right. And then like I mentioned, there's really no limitation of what you can do with data once it's in Looker. So of course, web interface, you can self-serve, and really this means more than just filtering and drilling, but really truly creating queries on your own without knowing SQL. Right? You can export data. But beyond that, scheduled delivery, you can integrate Looker into a really wide range of workflows and automate quite a few. And we have a full API. So anything you can do within Looker, you can leverage our API to do, which is how we integrate with the workflows. A any questions, guys? Will we get this PowerPoint? Yeah, I can send this PowerPoint out. Are you an optimization layer? And, and prior to that, you had showed Cloudera as one of your partners. Yeah. So if I have a call up, are you sitting yet on top of their optimizer, acting in behalf of them? And are what SQL level are you compliant with or no? I use an actual language to speak to you. Yeah, so Looker, if we support any SQL compliant database. So Impala is fine, right? So we have dialect specific <coughs> connections. But so, it has its own optimizer. My question, what I'm hearing from you is that You'll take my question, and I don't know if I'm giving it to you in the form of proper SQL or some other language. And you're SQL. trying to, you turn it into some set equivalent. Uh, 
what I mean, set theory equivalent to push it to the back end. What are you truly sitting on top of their optimizer? Are you going around it sort of like with a MySQL database? I could have the NO engine or some other engine. Should I see you as a replacement engine? I'm not too sure with Impala, but we are connecting via JDBC directly to the database, and we're just issuing SQL via the LookML model to it. Yeah. Uh, you guys hear me? Yeah. So um, basically, we would, it would be just like writing a SQL query on Impala. Looker would be writing that SQL for the end user and under the hood. And we'd be taking advantage of all kinds of optimization that Impala has natively using the native Impala dialogue. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, guys? Do you connect to graph databases? Sorry, what's that? Graph databases. Yeah, we'll go through all of our connections here in just yeah, a second. Can you repeat the question? So everybody hears what the question was. Can you connect to graph databases? Eric, do you want to take this? No, we do not. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, any SQL compliant database, because in essence, again, Looker's not storing data. We're just writing SQL back to the database and issuing results. Um, I think now would probably be a good time just to let Eric give a high level overview of the tool, take us through a basic demo. Um, sounds good. Awesome. Thanks, Eric. Uh, thanks, Scott. Thanks, Scott. Uh, so, I'm going to talk about the Cool, so let's see Looker in action. Um, I'm going uh, to I'm going to give you kind of a quick kind of 10 minute overview of, of Looker's main functionality, um, uh, and then Abud and Talal after me are going to kind of uh, focus more on an in depth workshop on how Looker kind of works in the traditional data science workflow. Um, but first, I just want to kind of introduce you to uh, everything that Looker does. So. Um, like Scott was mentioning, we're entirely web-based, so there's no kind of development software or any uh, plugins or clients that you're installing. Everything is from the development to the consumption is all done in a browser. Um, so that includes, you know, traditional dashboarding like you see here, um, as well uh, as. So I'm going to walk you through kind of these three main uh, parts of the product. So in addition to the dashboard you see here, we're also, uh, give me one second, going to enable truly ad hoc and self-service reporting for an end user. Um, everything you see kind of in this menu of fields that you would have to be able to kind of select from and create any query you want is all being defined in that look and build modeling layer that, that Scott was referring to. Um, so I think we'll actually kind of start there, start in the back end, uh, and, and actually build a project from scratch to give you a sense of how Looker is working. Um, and then we'll go into kind of some of these other, these other pieces. So basically the, the first step, if we were connecting to your database, um, we're gonna establish that database connection. So we, we talked about kind of all the different databases we support, you can see that. Um, that includes some of the legacy players like a, a Teradata, an Oracle, um, as well as some of the, the new modern uh, MPP databases like Amazon Redshift, Google BigQuery. Uh, it also includes some of the SQL on Hadoop uh, uh, languages like a Hive, a Spark, a Presto. Um, so at the end of the day, Looker is speaking SQL with that database. Um, and, and take advantage of all of the computing power. So let's let's start a brand new project from scratch. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna create a new look and build project to give you a sense of how this would work if we were plugging this into uh, your database. Um, so I'm gonna create a new look and build project. I'll just call this one demo for now. I'm gonna connect to an Amazon Redshift database um, uh, that has some kind of e-commerce uh, transactional data in it. Um, so when I create this project, this is actually going to scan the database. It's going to detect table relationships and joins for us. And it's going to give us a baseline set of code to actually start working with and exploring the data. Uh, so let me go ahead and do that. How many of you guys have used some of the legacy BI tools like a, a business object, a MicroStrategy, Cognos? Cool. Um, so 
what LookML is and kind of what the, the great things about those older tools that were made about 20 years ago is they provided uh, a semantic layer that provided governance uh, in terms of how your end users were querying the data. Um, look, LookML is, is a modern approach to that. So rather than kind of the GUI drag and drop uh, that you might be used to in those environments, this is now a code-based language that's allowing that's allowing you to very flexibly and in an agile development life cycle um, build some of that same data governance. Uh, one example of that is Git is actually integrated with our product, so everything is version controlled through Git or GitHub. Okay, yeah, I will definitely zoom in if you guys uh, can't read this. I'll walk you through kind of what we're looking at. Um, cool, so basically what we're looking at in this data set is we have the following tables in this database, so an e-commerce transactional database. Um, and we've created a file for each of those tables. We've also, also created this model file, um, and this is where the, the actual joins that I was referring to are, are uh, described here. So let's, let's take an example. We've got this order items table, Lookers automatically kind of derive some of these joins, say, to the users table because of the naming conventions of these columns. So there's a, there's a user ID in both of these tables. Lookers join in that. If I want to change that join condition, I, I can do that very quickly. Um, and this is part of, part of how Looker is going to write SQL for the end user. Um, we then have kind of all of the fields level metrics, the dimensions, the measures stored in these view files. Um, and what we're looking at here is basically we've Looker's created a, a dimension or a field for every column in this particular table. If I open one of these up, I've got an order status. I can name this however I want to make it user friendly so they understand what field that is. Um, in the SQL parameter, I can actually embed business rules or SQL snippets within this. So um, I can I can create reusable kind of transformations that I'm going to define once, and then those are going to be baked into the tool. Think of this as almost like a, an Excel formula that you've got in maybe 70 different spreadsheets. Rather than storing that in 70 different places, we're putting this in one place so that that's baked in and all of your users are using that, that same definition um, across the board. Um, what these files are doing now, if I go to this new project that I just created, is they're kind of they're serving up for maybe a non-technical end user to be able to analyze this data. So uh, think of this as a, a data analyst. They might know a little bit of SQL, maybe they don't know SQL at all, but they're able to start coming here and selecting from a menu of fields, such as you know, let me show a, a count of orders, and under the hood. Looker is now writing SQL in the native dialect of your database. So we're connected to Redshift, we're writing uh, in Redshift dialect. dialect. We're connected to um, Spark on Hadoop, we're, we're, we're using Spark SQL. Um, and as I'm clicking on these things, let's say I'll bring in the user state, Looker is only going to join to the necessary tables when it needs to. So I'm literally just kind of joining to that user table and, uh, and grouping. On that. And now, when I hit that, we'll hit a lightweight layer on top of that database so that we can execute queries against it. Um, so, kind of this new project I created would just really expose the columns of this, this table, which is somewhat interesting, but not really. But where Looker starts to take off is when I can actually create brand new metrics. So, I'm going to define one time, and then everyone in my organization is going to use that single source of truth. Um, so, let's take an example of total profit. I don't, I don't have a column in my database that tells me what total profit is, um, but I can quickly derive that field uh, by pointing to some of the other fields in that I've already defined. So sale price here is a column that, that's already been kind of defined up here. Looker is very modular, so once you've defined a field, you can now point to that in other fields and, and build on top of what you've what you're built. Um, so I'm going to take that sale price, I'm going to subtract the items cost, which is over in another table. Um, I'm going to throw in a description for my end user so they know how this is defined and what it means. I'm going to misspell it purposely. Um, so now I've defined total profit, and if I go back to this, this explore page and refresh the browser, um, I'm going to have that available to me. 
and now I can start to, to execute queries directly off of this, this new metric. Uh, so let's, let's talk about kind of why that's important or why our customers like this type of workflow. Um, so one, we define total profit once. Now everyone's going to use that single source of truth. It's not going to live in one workbook or one dashboard and kind of be siloed in that. It's going to live in this central metadata layer where everyone is using Looker. And that could be an ad hoc query, dashboard, an API call, an embedded uh, visualization on a web page. All of those things are using this one central piece of code. Um, so that's, that's one part of it. The second part of it is, is kind of the agility that comes along with this. So rather than going through that kind of uh, legacy approach that Scott had the slide on where you're doing ETL, and you're, you're adding a new column in your database, and then you're going to your BI tool and you're loading that into the BI tool and adding a field there, that old process took so much time that by the time an end user asks for something, three weeks later they might see it after that, that entire process. This approach is bringing a lot more agility to that process. I want to I have total profit available. I just added it in five seconds. I've got uh, a, a Git integration here, which I haven't configured yet, but uh, once that Git repo is set up, I can push that, commit, to, commit that to my branch. Um, I can merge that with other changes that another developer might be working on in the same file and push that to production within, you know, within minutes and have that out to my user. So that's kind of the agility, that's what our customers are, are enjoying about Looker, and it's saving them a lot of time in fact, this, this uh, traditional SDLC process. Let me pause for any questions so far. Can you change that SQL if you think it's not right? Yeah, good question. The question was, can I change this uh, SQL here? Um, so the, the answer is kind of yes and no. So right here, no. We cannot change it, and really that's by design because we want to have data governance. We want um, the, the IT team to really define a standard way of querying this data so that we can give this to as many end users and they can play with the data as much as they want and not make mistakes and not maybe write wrong SQL and can actually get an invalid answer. Um, if you don't like how Looker is writing the SQL, you can you can do that basically by editing the look and So if I want that uh, that join to be an inner join versus a left outer join, for example, I'm going to change that in this model in there, and that's going to apply to that change. Does Looker ever instantiate that computed field in uh, in a persistent manner? I.e., I have 100 analysts all connecting and they're all looking for this this profitability computed field. Yep. Each time, what I'm seeing here is it's executing it virtually each time as a view on reference. Will it ever predict or think, hey, 100 people asking this day after day, it should be uh, computed beforehand instead of wasting time either in AWS paying them paying you know Amazon each time we're computing this thing as opposed to one time and then the simple IO reference. Sure. Yeah so the, the question was kind of how we're deriving total profit for example like it's, it's happening in the SQL query itself so it's not persisted in a column in a data in a, in a database somewhere. Um, and would Looker uh, maybe persist that uh, kind of after that's done. So there's Couple things there. So one, we do have a caching layer. So let's run this exact same query again. We'll see that it actually loads from cache because it's basically the exact same SQL query uh, that was run within five minutes, and that five minutes can be configured to be, um, you know, 24 hours or you know whatever. Um, uh, a lot of, and kind of to that point, a lot of uh, our customers are using Looker to very do a rapid prototype. So they're gonna they're gonna figure out what metrics they want to uh, put together. Maybe some of them are calculated wrong or they're not useful. And they're using Looker to very quickly define those metrics and push it out to end users and see what's working, see what's not working. Um, and if it's something that's going to be used all the time, that might make sense to actually be persisted in the database. Then you can decide after you've been using the BI tool and users have been using it, you know, it makes sense to go back to the ETL tool and actually put that in there and make it. And so it's kind of, you can use it as kind of a graphic Um, is it possible to overload a definition or reference historical definitions? Um, 
can you give me an example? We were showing how you included the business logic in the definition and that was a single source. Yes. But what if you wanted to have an alternate set of business logic for that, that, you know, that definition? Yeah, so the question was, can you have a business definition and have maybe an alternate version of that? So yes, so we can do that in a couple ways. We can do that via the user, so maybe one user group has a certain calculation and another user group defines it a different way. We can actually define what we call it user attribute to say if user group X is querying this field, calculate it this way, but if user group or maybe uh, marketing or another department is querying that, then actually we can change this. Um, we do that um, you know, almost kind of like an almost like a case statement, but dynamically, depending on who the user is, calculate it. So in typical enterprise setting, uh, the main challenge is how to get data from different data sources, not single data sources. And most of the time when you say that you can change the ad field, you have to go all the way to source of the data and then change it. The reason most of the time is because you are getting data from different sources and trying to match and merge together. How does the uh, search help with that? Yeah, so the um, question was kind of around uh, integrating multiple different disparate data sources. So what our customers are doing and kind of core to our philosophy is really kind of centralizing that data into um, a single database. So rather than kind of having lots of different data sources disparately and having maybe connectors to them and sucking them into memory, there's, there's limitations that come with that approach. Um, so we believe in kind of moving that data into a central repository, uh, if you can. Um, because you can truly own it and do whatever you want with it, uh, so that's that's kind of the approach that most that our customers are taking. Um, that said, if you had kind of you know different databases within your uh, ecosystem, you could have on a dashboard this look coming from one database, this coming from another database. So there are ways to visualize that and, I, and, and put them all in one place, um, regardless of if they're kind of in the same physical database. That you showed us in the beginning, which is uh, this one. Yeah, no, no. Was that before? Yes. Is that LookML? This is yeah. So this is all the script you see right now. It's, it's all LookML. Yeah. And can you work off a of text file, or do you have to work in the browser? Can you work off the URL? Technically, you could work outside of our IDE. I think there's a lot of benefits of doing it in here. It's gonna, it's gonna, you're gonna be able to validate it. Uh, uh, to make sure you didn't make any typos or mistakes. Um, uh, and you're going to have help kind of within it. We do have customers that have actual machine generated LookML, so they have built uh, an application to actually just write LookML systematically um, and, and use the, the Git configuration and integration to kind of uh, deploy that almost as if it was another user. Um, so that is something that is possible because it's basically just a series of, of files. Okay. Forgive me, do I have to have? the database, if I just have straight Avro or uh, file sets out there, can you mount those and give me the joins or whatnot that way? So Avro, Parquet, any self-describing file set, even simple JSON. Um, so the question was, can we query files directly without a database? So. Um, Sometimes, so we have some some dialects, some technologies like Amazon Athena, where you're querying basically S3 files directly. Um, Athena is giving us a SQL layer to query those files. So we're kind of using those SQL layers to do that query. Um, I'm trying to think of some other examples, but uh, if there's other databases like Snowflake that, that handle JSON very well um, in an unstructured way, uh, which basically allow you to write SQL against raw, raw JSON. A lot of our customers are leveraging that to query something like that. You didn't follow up on what ML stands for. Oh, sorry, yeah. And, uh, you know, to kind of, kind of continue on the question, you know, what I was asking is if I, if I have Python scripts that you have a whole bunch of different things, can I 
can I call this from a Python? That, that's where I was kind of. Yes. Like, so the as part of my work. Yeah. So the the ML and lookML stands for either markup language or modeling language or both. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's 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 basically does both of those things. Um, the other question was, can I pipe data through Looker into Python? Yes, and we're going to go into that in a lot more detail after I get done. Um, and so just a kind of Looker is also accessible through our API, and this is our API documentation, so you can see all of the different kind of endpoints that are available. So I, any uh, report, which we call a look, basically, can be referred to via API, um, and I can run that you know, and, and uh, give it a result format like JSON, pipe that into anything it wants. So uh, Looker itself is actually running off our API. So pretty much anything you can do with Looker UI, you can also do through our API. And this is all of this for API. Yes? Can you upload Excel spreadsheets and combine data, blend data? Yeah, so the question was, can we upload Excel spreadsheets and, and blend data? Uh, what our customers are doing in that case is basically um, uploading the Excel into their database and it's going to serve as basically another table. Again, that's also on the kind of data governance side. So rather than have a user upload an Excel document that might be out of date or it might be incorrect and it can create kind of a chaotic situation where you don't know whose data is correct, that's kind of by design as well to kind of keep it in the database and get government. Um, is LookML an open source language that you didn't build on top of or? How did this fit together? Is it your proprietary? Yeah, uh, so the question was, LookML, is it open source or proprietary? It is a propri proprietary language. Um, yeah, so it, it's it basically a SQL abstraction layer, so it's working on the same kind of concepts of SQL. Um, but yeah, it's a proprietary language. Cool. Um, so that is a pretty good introduction. So we've kind of just focused on LookML so far. You know, once your metrics are defined, then you can very quickly create um, queries, visualizations. Uh, let, me, let me give you one example of that, and I'll probably hand it off to, to Law. Um, so let's let's build up a, a query from scratch on a, on a model that's been built out a little bit. So I'll take a simple query. I want to know my, my, my sales for the last 90 days. I'm going to bring in my sales, I'm going to bring in my date, my order created, I'm going to filter on the last 90 days, the last three months. Um, and maybe I want to pivot this or also compare my product departments. So I'm going to, so any of these fields can be kind of, can be filtered on, any of the fields can be pivoted on as well, um, which create kind of a, a pivot table directly within the UI. Um, you get your data set back in this, this data table, and then you can also choose to visualize this if you want to. So now I can choose from these different visualization options. Maybe I wanted to align or an area of chart of, of comparing kind of the men's and women's department uh, over the last 90 days of sales. Um, you know, very, very basic query. Uh, once that's built, I can share this. I don't need to download it to Excel and email to someone. Everything is shareable via a URL, so I can literally copy and paste this, every query that you run in Looker has its own unique query slug, uh, kind of ident identifier of the query, so that I can, without even saving it as a report, I can put this in an email and it's a message and someone else can pull that up. Um, that's powerful in a way because you're always looking at live data. You're not downloading to Excel and, and um, you know, sending an email that Excel file kind of becomes out of date within a few hours or a few days. Uh, by passing these URLs, you're, you're able to always um, and once you save this as a report, again, it's, it's available via our API, so you can call that via API and, and send that to whatever process you want. Um, we can set up scheduled emails, scheduled alerts, um, and obviously pop these onto a, a dashboard that's going to then be, you know, uh, act as one of these individual tiles on, on the dashboard. Um, Cool, so I think that's, that's most of what I wanted to show you. Uh, any other questions before we hand it off and kind of go through um, how Looker fits into kind of the data science workflow? Can Looker integrate with Active Directory for security? 
Yes, so the uh, question was, does Looker integrate with Active Directory? Um, so yes, we integrate with Active Directory, LDAP, SAML, Google Authentication for a single sign-on. Yes? Do you do, you do like particularly for BigQuery location bot data usage or visibility? BigQuery is like user management is weak as far as I'm concerned. So are you assisting with any of that? Um, so we assist on BigQuery with data usage on, uh, so uh, I think um, Abu's gonna have a, a, a demo on a BigQuery database that will actually show you kind of, it'll estimate the query size if that's what you mean and, and kind of determine the cost of the query because with BigQuery you're actually paying per query. Is that what you mean? Yeah, can you limit users? I mean, can you say like, you yeah. have like a, you know, a budget or a quota, you yes. know, kind of, or a limit? Yeah, so you can limit users and, and make sure they don't execute a uh, you know a two dollar query on you know the entire database. Uh, so yes, you can. Do that. Yep. Yes. So when you send out the report, can you send it to anybody or does the person have to have access to it? Yeah. So the question was, uh, when we send out a report, does the user, the person you're sending to, need to have need to be a Looker user? So um, when we do scheduled emails, so I could schedule this dashboard um, if I was in developer mode to send an email every day, every week. The recipient of that email doesn't need to be a Looker user, they're just receiving an email. Um, that email also has a hyperlink in it. So if I wanted to click on it, and drill down and filter and kind of explore the data, then, then I would need, need to be a Looker user to do that. But to receive the email, you don't need to. Excellent, so I think um, we're going to turn it over to Talal and we're gonna go through kind of how Looker fits into the traditional data science workflow um, from that. Thanks, guys. Is this working? Uh, uh, all right, thanks, guys. Uh, so, yeah, so we wanna transition a little bit here to uh, more of the data science things uh, side of things. So uh, I know this group's all kind of like right in between uh, BI and, and, and data science. I saw kind of a mix of everything in here. Um, so uh, I wanna, we want to talk a little bit about you know where where Looker fits into like that entire stack. So we talked a, we talked a lot about kind of the internal analytics side of things. That's all the stuff that that Hutch was just showing. Um, but really, you know what what Looker is sort of aspiring to be is is not not just a BI tool, but uh, a data platform. And so where we really fit in is, you know, we want to be that, that uh, layer that sits in between all that raw data that you have somewhere and then wherever you want to actually use that data, whether that's through internal analytics and building visualizations and dashboards like you just saw, um, or whether it's through delivering, you know, building custom applications or doing uh, predictive modeling and statistical modeling. And, and that's really where, um, uh, you know, where you, you see more of the platform side of things. And so all of the things that you just saw, that central model where you're defining all the business logic and, and you know, uh, creating these optimized queries that are going right against the database, that's really useful in places outside of just, you know, dashboards and stuff like that. You want consistency, you know, when you're doing data science workflows, you don't want to be using a separate set of logic from what the you know rest of the business is using, and, and um, you know there's a ton of advantage of having that caching layer and having that sort of uh, in between layer to deliver the data outside of it. So what Abu's going to show uh, right here is you know how do you take maybe a model that you've created in Looker and now leverage that query engine and and that caching layer and all the stuff we were just talking about and, and sort of the power of, of a, an underlying database like BigQuery. Um, and now use it in another workflow, like the data science workflow, totally outside of Looker, still leveraging that model and not having to kind of redefine one-off SQL queries within a within R or within Python. Uh, so, boot. is this this one? showing you the data set that we're working on. Uh, we've set up an instance um, connected to a data set on Google BigQuery. You know, everyone who put their email on the list, we're actually going to give you guys access to this instance so you can actually jump in. I'll play around both tonight and for the next two weeks and, and hopefully build some cool stuff on your end. 
Um, but for now, I'm going to kind of just familiarize yourself. We kind of went through some basic modeling, but first with the data set, then through the API, and then I'll actually walk you through an example that I built with R of running predictive analytics um, with what we actually build out of R. So you know, once you guys get access to the instance, you'll, you'll see a home page. You'll have all the links for everything you need. So from doc, Looker documentation, the Looker API page that Eric was just showing us. And then an example of uh, Looker uh, implementing Looker in your data science workflows, either with Python, Jupyter, or um, using Looker and R library for the Looker API. So the data set that we're working with today uh, is a, a New York City taxi data set um, in BigQuery. So this is basically all taxi trips in New York uh, in the past five years, and all the information about those trips, number of passengers, the fare, the payment type, et cetera. Um, so as you can see here, we kind of built an example dashboard. You guys have access to these dashboards in the browse section. What we're going to focus more on uh, now is the explore the modeling and, and then that, um, the R workflow. So, before we actually get into it, what we're going to do is I'll actually just open the Explorer and we'll just run a few queries as we just did um, in that example data set, but um, with kind of this taxi data set, just to familiarize ourselves. So as an example, let's just start with getting a count of trips. I'm going to hit run. And again, we'll check the SQL looker, as we saw before, is just going to run the count of trips. No need to bring in anything else, not a different query. Um, just to kind of play around a little bit more, if I wanted to say, see this count of trips by um, you know, the pickup month of the trip, I can pull in that dimension, hit run. And again, the SQL updates. Um, the, the SQL updates are to bring in both whatever time conversions are needed to get it into the pickup month, the count of taxi trips, both fields that I defined in my model, and now I see that here um, in the Explorer. And then finally, you know, as a last example again, um, we can slice it by one of these other facts about the trip, such as number of passengers or payment types. In this case, I'll bring a number of passengers. As we saw before, Looker will take care of the data logic, and uh, we'll get the results back in the browser that we can then, of course, visualize. So this is kind of the workflow we just saw uh, with Eric in the demo instance. And what I want to do today is, as an example, think about um, the thing that I wanted to try predicting is how you know, what are the factors that affect how much uh, taxi drivers are getting, pick, uh, are getting tipped? You know, is it the distance of the trip, um, you know, the type of passenger, who's riding, how many riders? And before I do that, um, let's just run a couple examples to see you know, what is the, say, average tip by the month. In 2015, I'll pull that in, hit run, and we can kind of see what that average tip is. It's about a dollar, um, a dollar and a half, a little low, but but I realized as I was building this, and then we're going to start calling on these fields that I create in uh, through the API calls when I actually implement this in R. Is a lot of uh, the reason these may be so low is that a lot of uh, records don't actually have tip amount because maybe they're paid in cash and you don't actually have that information. So this is where I can start to again use the model to create new fields. So something I'm going to do before we actually start running these in R is I'm going to jump back into our model. So you guys, again, will all have access to this model. And you'll see it's a pretty simple uh, data set. You have the explorer of the taxi trips table. And in the taxi trips table, uh, uh, taxi trips view file, uh, there's a lot of built out dimensions and measures for you guys to play with. So we've, we've put in a few, like airport destination and uh, likely airport location, etc. You guys uh, have full liberty to go in and add your own once you guys are logged in. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to go to my tip field. Oh, let's see where that is. And we are now going to okay, I may have deleted it, so let's try it again. Up there it is, and now we're going to create that new field that I was talking about to see whether or not a trip actually uh, did have a tip record. So we're going to call this tipped. Let's just zoom in a bit there. And the type of field here uh, that I'm going to create is actually a yes no. So obviously we've seen kind of numbers and strings uh, and whatnot. This is 
more licorice Boolean operator instead of just writing the actual raw SQL for this field. I'm going to write what is the condition for this to be true. So for this to be true, I just want my tip field to be greater than zero. Again, just referring to the field uh, that we already have in the model. So I'll go back, I'll save this, and now we can go back to the explore, refresh it, and we'll see that field we just created will be immediately available to us here in the explore. So what I can do now is actually just add it as a filter and make sure that we're only looking at trips where there was actually a tip. <coughs> Quickly, we'll see now that's been implemented in the model, in the where clause, be able to reuse that field any way we want. And we'll see now the tips climb up a little. So that was just kind of a quick look at the data set. And now what we're going to be able to do is actually access the data through those API calls and implement it. And basically any data science workflows you like. Uh, I built an example through R. I have a quick example to show as well on Jupyter. You guys will have access to those docs. But the idea is that you can really use this in any way you want through Looker's API. So I'm going to go uh, right to the API here by clicking on Looker API reference and log in with my credentials, which you guys will all receive as well. Oh, sorry about that. And the first thing we'll do actually is we're going to go to the browse section and we're going to open actually one of the books that we've created before. So I'm going to open this, um, you know, the trip by months query that we just built out. And see how now we can call on this query uh, in the API. So if I come back here, Go back to our run look API call. You'll see there's a lot of different ways you can do this. You can run a look that you built out, you can run a query through that query slug, or you can actually run a query that you haven't built out yet by calling on looker. So we're going to do a few of those here today. So just so you can see it here as an example, I'm going to open the run look API call. And as we were seeing before, I'm just going to grab that look ID right there, copy it paste it as my look ID, tell Looker what format I want it in, we'll go for CSV now, try it out, and we'll see there's that same information we were looking at, trips by month, and now run our API call. So that's one way to run it, build your, build your query in Looker first, just grab the look, and, and then run it through the API call. Another way is to actually call the parameters as, as I was saying. So now that we've kind of seen an overview uh, of the API and accessing, again, those parameters we just created, I'm going to walk you through the example I now build in R. So through the, through the home page um, link that I, uh, that I put right here to the R library, you guys will be able to download and install that library. And I'll actually open up this R page here. So you'll see the, the first thing that I did here is actually, I've already downloaded the library, the instructions are on there, but I'm going to call on the look R library, and I'm going to run this, um, this code to basically tell R, this is the instance that I'm accessing, and this is my API secret code. You guys will all have um, these credentials emailed to you if you put your email on the list, and now that means that I can start running some API calls. So at, for, sorry, for a first example, we're going to just try running that same look that we did in the Looker console here in R. So I'm going to create a parameter and add into it that same look. Number eight, hit run. It now, it's now query uh, that, uh, that big query database through Looker through that API call. And now I can print. Oh. Print that out. And now we can start to see how we can access that data in R. And this is going to work using Looker to, to really do that data preparation, the creation of custom metrics, and at the end, the visualization of any predictive models we create. And really letting R or Python or your data science tool do what it's good at, the analytics and, and, and the predictive modeling. So that was a simple example. I built out something slightly more complex, uh, an actual regression model to again see what factors were affecting tips. And the few things I, I, I tried to think about and pull into my first pass of the model, and this is my uh, code that, again, you guys should all have access to um, the links that I provide. The first thing that I wanted to do is, I'm going to use this, this different uh, API called run inline query. That's what I was referring to. Instead of actually running the look I created, I'm going to actually run an API called that's going to call on parameters that I've created on the model. The value there being now that if any of these parameters that I'm about to call on were to change, 
All I have to do is go in the model, make that update, and basically every single workflow in my data science tool, run calling on these parameters to do the data preparation, that chain is going to flow and propagate through all of those. I don't have to go through every single query that I run to prepare and make that update. I'm doing it in one location. So here, a few things that I decided to take a look at to see what I could tip. First, I said, let's see distance. You know, people going farther, are they tipping more? Hopefully they are. It's a larger fare, but let's check and see if that's the case. I also wanted to look at number of passengers. You know, are you more likely to tip if there's someone next to you in the car peering over your shoulder, or, or if you're all by yourself? And then finally also, the pickup hour of the day. Are you more likely to tip at night when you're out getting drinks and getting dinner, or in the morning when you're on your way to work? So what I've done here is run the inline query, calling on the model, the view, and then what fields we want to prepare the data. So we're just basically creating one big table that has all the records and showing columns of those fields, hour of day, number of passengers, trip distance, and tip amount. We can have filters as well, basically building a query the same way that you would in the Explorer, but right here in the R console. So my filters, I've kept it to look at 2015. For the sake of, of simplicity, I kept it to one day. And then I've now called upon that custom metric we just created, tipped, and made sure it's yes. So again, you don't really need to call on fields that exist in the database. These can be fields that you've created in the model. So once I run that query to prepare the data, I then use that data in a linear regression model. And what I'm doing is just, let's see how those three factors uh, affect that tip amount. And then finally, we're just running the query. So I've actually took a screenshot of the results right here, just so you guys can see how this all works out at the end. So we run the model, and as the first pass, we get you know, an R squared of 0.67. Not amazing, but good enough for kind of this first pass of the model. And we get our coefficients of this predicted model. How each of these things are actually affecting the data model. Now this is where it gets interesting because you get these coefficients and generally in your data science tool, you probably you know, build some static visualizations and send them out. And if you want to rerun the model, you go in, you rebuild everything, get more static visualizations, send them out again. But here, as I mentioned before, we're not only going to use Looker for the data preparation and the creation of custom metrics, we're also going to use it for that visualization piece and seeing how good our model is visually and, and being able to then use all those other features we discussed, scheduling, alerting, etc., outside of, of the R workflow. So what I've done here as an example is if we go back to the model, I've taken those coefficients and I've now created fields, and let me just uncomment this here, that will allow me to see what my predictive model looks like right here in Looker. So now I basically created one dimension for each of the coefficients. You'll see that I hard coded them. Ideally, and we have this example um, in, in our workflow article, you would actually just run a script to write the results of your predictive model right back into your database. And what that would mean is instead of hard coding these and creating an average tip predi prediction measure that's going to help you predict future tip amounts, by writing into the database, I'll actually have this automatically update as I train my model. So the more data I feed into my model, and the better these coefficients get at predicting my actual model, these dimensions will just be pointing to fields that I've written back into my database. And those coefficients will dynamically update. So basically just going back full circle where everything kind of feeds into each other, and any changes I make, I never need to really break that. But for the sake of example today, I've hard coded those coefficients, and we've now created an average tip prediction prediction uh, field. So again, just before, just like before, if you looked at average tips, I'm creating that same measure, but now instead of taking it from the actual tips, I'm using the coefficients and using actual uh, raw data to see what our predictive model um, would spit out for those fields. So now I'm going to save this and go back into our explore. And we'll now be able to access those fields just as if you know, they, they, they were the actual fields in our table, um, now that we implemented them back in our model. So as an example, we have already by month average tip um, in 2015. Now let's say I wanted to see, and I, I created this in a separate dropdown, what my predictive model would have shown for those same average tips. I hit run. Again, I always like to check the SQL. And you'll see now, it's actually using my model to predict those trips. And again, if you were able to write these back in your database, these would be pulling directly from um, those coefficients that are always getting better the more data you get um, each day. 
now we can check and actually quickly see side by side how good my model really is. So we'll see. <laughs> In green, these are the tips that I'm predicting, and in blue, those are the actual tips. So on a month level, it seems like my model is predicting a little bit too high. <laughs> and that's where you would hopefully keep training your model and having this update automatically through those dimensions that are calling on those columns you're writing back into your database. And obviously now we just visualized this, but you can basically do any of the functionality you're doing in Looker with this predictive model. So I'll be able to create visualizations, drill paths, create scheduled alerts on these to see, you know, oh, if my predictive model ever gets within X percent of the actual truth, send me an email so I know, okay, we're good to go. Um, but that's just kind of a high level overview of how you use Looker um, in one kind of R workflow, but again, this can be done in any. In addition to that R example, we also have a Jupyter example with Python, but it's, it's basically the exact same thing. You're authenticating, and then you're running the query. Um, you're, you're calling on the API with some query slug, with the query parameters, and then you know, I, I did a linear regression model, but you can get as complex uh, as you want um, in terms of whatever workflows you're currently running. So just want to do a quick time check here. Uh, so the, the whole Looker team, uh, we've got a bunch of analysts uh, here. We're going to be sticking around afterwards. Uh, so if you guys have any questions, please come to us. We're going to be uh, sitting in the back with our laptops and happy to talk about it. We want to pass it back to Frank and make sure we got time to uh, uh, chat a little bit about uh, some of the, the, the awesome things that he's been uh, building as well. So uh, thank you. Cool. So